What's up? This is Josh and Kelsey here at the AHL All-Star Skills Competition, the Mass Mutual Center in Springfield, Massachusetts. You're watching Post to Post. Hello and welcome to Post to Post, the channel where we discuss all things hockey and all teams. Uh, you know what? If San Jose Vegas is the series to watch in the West, Toronto Boston is the series to watch in the East. In my Absolutely. opinion, that's no offense against Washington or the Islanders or Pittsburgh or any other team in the East. This team just has that rivalry. They met in the early uh, was it 2011 or 2013? They played. I think it was 2011. Anyways, maybe uh, 2010. That. Kind of sparked. I mean, oh, they already yeah. had this. They already had the rivalry because they were, they were in the same division and stuff. And their original six original teams. Original six, but that so that's year sparked the rivalry between the teams. And then, as we know, they played each other last year in the playoffs. We went to seven games. It was an incredible series. Uh, and I can't imagine a boring Toronto Boston series. And I'm very excited that they're playing each other. And we knew that they were going to play each other for probably the past three months. At, well, I don't know about three months, but two and a half. It was a pretty good chance. Certainly, we knew for the last three or four weeks that. It was almost impossible for them yes. to not be playing each other. The only question mark for a little while was who would have home ice advantage. But even that became a pretty much a done deal two weeks ago, at least. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, so. I don't like either of these teams. I'm a Canadians fan. It, it My skin is burning wearing this jersey and this hat. And it probably looks weird to see these in combination, but I do it because... Uh, these are the two teams that are playing, and there's lots of Boston and Toronto fans watching. So uh, I am very excited to watch this series. Um, I don't think I have a favorite. There's a lot of, as a, as a Canadians fan, there's a lot of players on both teams that I don't really like. But as a hockey fan, there's a lot of players in both of these teams that I absolutely love. So I'm very excited for this series. I can't wait. I hope you guys are excited too. Uh, we're going to get into some stats here. We're going to get into some analysis and some comments and then... Cool. Give our, our final prediction in, in how many games at the end of this video. So I like it. Yeah. All right. If you look at the records, Boston 49-24-9. and nine. Toronto 46-28-8. and eight. Advantage Boston. Uh, goals for 259, 259 for Boston, 286 for Toronto. Advantage, advantage Toronto. Yep. Goals against 215 for Boston, 249 for Toronto. Advantage Boston. Power play percent, 25.9% um, for Boston, 21.8% uh, for Toronto. Advantage Boston. Penalty kill, 79.9 for Boston, 79.9 for Toronto. Even. Even, Steven. Uh, Face-off winning percentage is 50.7 for Boston and 53% for Toronto. Advantage Toronto. So I would say statistically Boston probably has just a slight edge on Toronto. But as we know, statistics don't really mean a whole lot. Our seasonal st seasonal statistics don't really mean a whole lot <laughs> in the playoffs. Uh, playoffs are whole different monsters. So Yeah, as I've said a couple of times, not just me, statistics tell you what happened, not what's going to happen. Exactly, so. yes. Yeah, they're they're yeah. fun to look at and everything, but they could be absolutely meaningless. Or they can mean everything. That's right. So. Uh, right. Trends are trends. Sometimes are very important in hockey. Uh, I'm just going to start off with some notes on the Bruins, and then I'll transition to Toronto. Uh, I would say that Boston is one of the best puck uh, cycling teams in the league, uh, specifically on the power play. I absolutely love watching this team play hockey when they control the puck because they're so good at cycling the puck. They have so much chemistry. Some of these line combinations have been together for uh, years. Uh, I mean. Marchand and Bertrand have been playing together in the same line for like eight years now or something yeah, crazy. It's so crazy. Uh, it's, it's really nice to see that that chemistry. Uh, Brad Marchand needs to be the guy who gets 100 points in a season, not the guy who gets 96 penalty minutes in a season. Or does a lot of licking. He, or does any kind of licking of any sorts. Can't have that this time. No licking. Brad. Can't. Like that was, there was playoff licking last year. <laughs> you should not be any licking ever, but especially not in the playoffs. I, I we agree. cannot have playoff licking. No, no postseason licking. No. Uh, he is such a good player. It's so frustrating watching him do this stupid stuff. Like he doesn't need to do any of that. We've we've talked about that to the ground, so we're not going to talk about it anymore. But I just want to mention that if he can be the player that get that gets 100 points in a season, and not the player that gets 96 penalty minutes, then this it could change the series. Like he, yep. he's a liability, and he's a season winner, uh, a series winner type of player. So yep. it's 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 kind of crazy to think about. Uh, Goaltending for Boston, who's going to start, Rask or Halak? I would assume that Rask would start. He's a very good uh, playoff goaltender. His stats back him up. Uh, he's he's been known to kind of be a little shaky in big moments in the past. Not so much specifically last year, but uh, there's a little question mark with Rask. Uh, as far as Halak, he's had a very good season. I would say a bounce back season in his career. Uh, his his numbers are are fantastic. He could probably be nominated for. Uh, the Vesna based on his stats, based on some other goalies who were nominated for the Vesna. But I still don't see him starting the series. I assume Rask is going to start. However, if Rask falters or if he gets injured, I'm still pretty confident that Halak can 
can protect this team in net. So uh, Boston's really lucky lucky to have both those goaltenders this year. It's almost an Islander situation. Almost, where you've got seriously. Two equally good goalies that are plug and play. Uh, very few teams have the ability to not depend only on one goalie, and Boston is one of them. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you think that Boston should play the matchup <clears throat> game with Toronto and try and shadow their superstars, like uh, Marner and Matthews? I think they should when they're home because they'll have the last line change and they can actually deploy the players to to play a man-on-man mm-hmm. style of hockey. When they're playing in Toronto for games two, uh, three and four, they'll be less able to do that. So I, I don't think they should throw all their eggs in that basket. I think some more zone play would be uh, maybe just as effective. If they play that well, it, it's good. What player on Toronto do you think Boston should uh, shut down? If they, if, they, if they had to choose one player. If they had to choose one player... I think Nylander is the kind of guy really? that, yeah, yeah, because I, I think he's, 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 uh, he's not really on the radar. He started late. He's still coming into, I think, to, into shape. The thing about Nylander is he's a bit sneaky and he's a bit underrated because he hasn't had that great of a year and all the drama around him, but he's a very good player. So he's a bit underestimated. So, uh, mm-hmm. you're not, I don't think you're wrong in that assessment. Um, cause he could, he could come out of nowhere and, and just light it he up. He could. So. And, and that's why I chose that name rather than the others, because the others are quite obvious. Mm-hmm. Uh, Toronto is, is a very, very deep team offensively. Very deep. Very yep. deep. And it's hard to cover them all to the same degree of, uh, effectiveness. But when you do that, when you put all your players on Marner and Matthews and Tavares, uh, then Nylander sneaks up the, sneaks up the side. That's right. And yep. bites you. So. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, what's your thoughts on uh, McAvoy this year? We had a bit of criticism on him uh, when he joined the league. How do you think he's performed this year? I haven't watched him a lot, frankly, and I haven't looked deeply at his stats. Uh, the buzz that was there last year for him has faded a little bit. He's come a little bit back to earth, I think. But I, I when I have watched him, I've been very impressed with him. He's a I, very solid player. I really felt like he's tamed down a lot yeah. from when he first joined the league. His, his temper is, is not so apparent. He's uh, a little bit more responsible with the puck and physically as well. Uh, taking less penalties and um, playing some really strong, consistent hockey. So I really feel like he's, his game is, has really improved just over the past eight months. Yeah, and when, you, when you're a defenseman, let's say, and you're not being talked about a lot, that's not a bad thing because you're not a defensive liability so much. Um, so I, I think uh, any player in that role, if they're not talked about a whole lot, is probably having a better, mm-hmm. a better time at their career. Uh, he does still have the edge when he needs it, and Boston may need to demonstrate that edge a little bit. Not so much, you know, the Marchand thing, but but they need to be a little bit physical. They they can. I think Toronto's got some fragility. I think they can uh, they can out hit Toronto. I think they can out body Toronto. I think so too. And uh, McAvoy will be a, a piece in that in that offense. Yeah, definitely. Defensive offense, I guess you'd call it. Another one of Boston's weapons is, I think, um, their underrated depth. <clears throat> we, we know how, how deep Toronto is up front, but I think globally, if you just look at the Boston team, I would say that they are the deeper team. Uh, I mean, you've got Heinen, who's a playmaker, DeBrusque, who can score goals, Bacchus with his physicality, uh, Krug, who's, who's very fast and a bit of a playmaker himself. Yeah. Uh, Boston has a lot of depth in every position, even in, in net. I mean, look at Halak, we spoke about him earlier. Uh, so Boston is, I would say, if you if you have the definition of depth and you had to pick a couple of teams, I think Vegas would be there, and I think Boston would be there as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Probably throw Nashville in there as well, a couple other teams. Um, but yeah, Boston is, is is pretty deep. They they have a lot of things they can hit you with, so it's a scary team. Yep. Um, I would say defensively, Boston is going to have to block a lot of shots. Toronto takes a ton of shots uh, per game. I think their average is like 33.1 or something per game this year. Uh, they can score... Uh, with any line, basically, Toronto's that, that deadly. So uh, I think Boston really needs to help Rask or Halak, whoever's in net out, and block a ton of shots. That's how they got to it, – it's, it's not the reason, but it's one of the reasons that why they got that cup a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, they blocked so many shots and were so good defensively. I think I'd like to see a little bit more of that come back into their game. And the, and the shot blocking comes only if you force the other team to play on the outside. Yeah. Because the shots have to come from a farther distance because you're making them play in the periphery. Toronto's very good at playing in close. Look at Matthews, how many goals he scores from three feet from the, from the goalpost. Yeah. And they have to keep him out of that zone. He's a little like Ovechkin when, when Ovechkin is in his zone. Matthews can just appear out of nowhere and find the puck out of nowhere and put it in the net. I'm, I'm not sure how you completely stop that threat, but uh, 
all the shop blocking in the world won't help you if Matthews is behind you. So yeah. <laughs> that's, that's one of the things that I think Boston has to not only get ready to sacrifice their body to stop pucks going in, but to make sure that Toronto's players stay along the boards and along the blue line and don't get close to the goalies. Yep, I agree. So. Um, also, I think Boston should not uh, underestimate the offensive depth of, of Toronto. I guess we kind of spoke about that already, but uh, they, they can strike with any line. They have so much depth. Um, and also, Morgan Riley is having, a, I would say, pretty much a career year. Yep. Uh, has been one of their best players. You can't as- underestimate him. He's not afraid to grab the puck and go up the ice and, and go on a rush. Uh, multiple times a shift. So like he, they have to keep their eye on him and, and shut him down and uh, force neutral zone turnovers and, and be pretty physical with him, I think, in the neutral zone as he's trying to gain the zone and stuff. So yep. he's going to be a player to watch for sure. Yep. Uh, on Toronto side of things, uh, I think Mitch Miner is the best player on Toronto. Uh, and I'd like to see him have the chance to do what he wants, set him free, allow him to, to, to take the puck and, and do what he wants with it. He, he, I find that when I have watched Toronto, uh, more often than not, that's the Marner that we see. But sometimes I see Babcock giving him some some talks on the bench after some shifts, and he kind of calms down a little bit after that. And I think that's a, a, a bit unfortunate. I'd like to see him actually have the um, allowance to do to do whatever he wants on the ice. He's their best player. Uh, I don't want to see him calm down a little bit. I want to see more with him mm-hmm. with the puck. So yeah. uh, I hope that happens. <clears throat> uh, I, I think Babcock should avoid switching up the lines. He's got a he's got that syndrome that uh, Claude Julien has a little yeah. bit with the line switching. So uh, I, I I really hesitate to, to switch up the lines. I, we saw that last year in the playoffs, and I think that hurt them a little bit. Um, but in the same regard, it also helped them a little bit too. They found some chemistry. So uh, I just think it's it's worse for the players. Because they've, you can't create chemistry without a little bit of experience playing to be together. So sometimes it takes a game or two to create that experience. Um, and maybe if you change the lines too quick, you're missing out on that opportunity. And Toronto has had, and Boston both, both teams, probably more so than any other teams in the league, have known from a long, long time back in the calendar who they're playing in the playoffs. They know they're going to be in and they know who their opponent is. So the scouting, the video, all of that work is more complete in the dressing rooms of Boston and Toronto than any other team in the league. Totally. So you can't have any excuses now. And as you say, to line juggling. By now, and Toronto's had a pretty slow end of the season, but that could be because Babcock was trying a few things because it didn't matter anymore. Mm-hmm. So hopefully that's what he was doing. Hopefully he was finalizing his line combinations that hopefully he will stick with uh, in the playoffs because... You can't play a game and a half and then decide that something's not working. If something's not working after a game and a half, after all the scouting and all the the strategic strategic that you've done, <laughs> new word, uh, then there's something wrong behind the bench. Mm. And I think there's a question mark there in Toronto. I've seen some rumblings lately of Babcock and Dubas not necessarily seeing eye to eye. I've on actually things. read that as well. That, that, I mean, that could be just be Toronto media. <clears throat> It could be, media, it could be because they're like Montreal media. They're, exactly. They, they pick up on everything, all the negatives and the positives. But uh, I don't want to hijack your Toronto talk, but I think there's a question mark there that's not doing the team any good right now. Mm. So I think a big win, uh, if they could get that quickly in Boston, would go a long way to settling that down. I, I agree, actually. That's a very good point. Yeah. Um, I think that Toronto, just a quick, <clears throat> quick question. Do you think that Toronto is a good defensive team? Well, the numbers say it isn't. It's a bit of hard. It's a kind of a hard question to answer because I would say, I would say, I would say they're not a bad defensive team, but I would say they're not a good defensive team. Like they're, I think they really need to be conscious now more than ever defensively, uh, especially against Boston, who can score uh, with it with any line. Uh, Toronto really needs to do to be aware of their uh, defensive problems. I guess uh, they need they to do. back check like. There's times where I see Matthews just gliding up the ice, and it, it just reminds me of Ovechkin in all those years. Yeah, uh, and no one seems to mention it. Maybe he's because he's a golden boy. Boy in Toronto media doesn't want to to make it known, um, but it is frustrating to watch. And I like Matthews. I have a Matthews jersey, but uh, I'm not biased. I you know like, yeah. call it like call it like you see it. Sometimes he's lazy. And uh, he can't be lazy in this series. He can't be. And the old adage goes, and it's not just for hockey, it's football and it's it's other sports. They say the best defense is a good offense. Yep. And I think if Toronto is going to survive this and, and succeed, they have to be in the Boston zone 
all the time. Yeah. And they have the talent to do that, frankly. That, that's what's scary. Yeah. They have the talent to do it and limit the opportunities that Boston has to come back down the ice. They won't be able to fully do that. Mm -hmm. And Boston needs to take advantage of those opportunities when they do get down the ice. Mm -hmm. But uh, Toronto uh, really, to save its defense, needs to pressurize with its offense. Yeah. And that, you, that's a good point. One of the, one of the things that <clears throat> Toronto is so good at is breaking up the play. Uh, of the opposing team coming out of their own defensive end and creating mm -hmm. something out of nothing, forcing yeah. turnovers before it gets to the blue line uh, in Boston's end or whatever team's end, um, and, and and regaining control of the puck uh, and creating something out of nothing. They're very good at that, one of the best in the league, if not the best. So yep. um, excited to see that. They need to keep that up. Uh, don't, it doesn't need to be pretty. Shoot the puck. Uh, they yeah. have the same... Uh, Calgary, we'll get into this when we do get into the Calgary video, but Johnny Goudreau is one of my biggest criticisms of, of him. He's always looking to pass first to make things pretty. Just shoot the puck. Like, yeah. just because Boston is going to try and block a lot of shots and play good defensively, Toronto needs to pepper the net with shots on Boston. They need to just to light up the light up the goal, shot after shot after shot. It doesn't need to be pretty. This is the playoffs. You get, score the hard goals, take a lot of shots. You never know what can happen. Three things can happen when you shoot. Well, four things. You can shoot the puck and miss. You can shoot the puck and score. You can shoot the puck and the goalie saves it, or you can shoot the puck and there's a rebound. Mm -hmm. And the shoot the puck in all those circumstances, either you're going to score or you're going to have a rebound. Those are the two good things that can happen when you shoot the mm -hmm. puck. That won't happen if you pass. If you pass the puck, guess what? Unless it goes off someone's skate by accident, you're not scoring. Now, the guy you pass it to might score. That's why you're passing the puck. Duh. But... Uh, you're, you're adding an extra degree of uncertainty there. Yep. Shoot the damn thing. Like you say, shoot it. And worst case or semi-worst case scenario is the puck doesn't go in, but it's available to some other player. Exactly. Or it gets tipped on the way there. Or it Option does. number five, maybe. Yeah. Uh, so exactly. you, you never know what can happen, especially in the playoffs. Yeah. Big goals have been scored by silly shots to the net. They, they have. And we, I don't know if it's going to be in this series, but there are eight series. Uh, five of them already started last night. Right? And yep. uh, there's uh, three more to go. Um, in one of those series, maybe to decide the series, there's going to be a junky, garbagey, controversial oh, totally. goal. At least one. Totally. So shoot the puck. Yep, definitely. Get that garbagey goal if, if that's what you need. Exactly. Uh, on the other end of the ice, though, <laughs> I, uh, support Anderson. He There's been controversial goaltender interference calls against Anderson in the regular season and in the playoffs last year. I would say support Anderson. Don't let him get run by a player. Don't let players get into his business. Uh, keep the keep the offensive Boston players out, outside of the paint and away from Anderson. Don't let him get frustrated. So I would say protect Anderson. That's got to be yeah, the top and of the list. To that point, I saw that the NHL released its officiating management teams for each of the series. Not so much the on-ice officials, but the people that will be at the games, watching the games. And I would be shocked if the NHL didn't do a lot of work in the last few days meeting with those officials and reestablishing where it wants them to be on so. the issue of goaltender interference. We can't have the same play being called different ways in different series. It just cannot happen. So I'm sure if the NHL is smart, and I think they are, they will turn the screws a bit and lock down the, the bandwidth for the various ways of interpreting goaltender interference, and they'll narrow that. And if they're smart, they'll also tell the coaches that they're going to narrow that ahead of time. So maybe all this has happened. I haven't read anything about it, but I'd be shocked if it wasn't going on to try to remove the last thing the NHL wants is what happened in the Super Bowl oh, or, yeah. or the or the championships leading up to the Super Bowl where there was a clear violation that wasn't caught at the time and it was not a reviewable play then. It will be next time, but it isn't this time. The NHL can't have a situation like that. Was that the pass interference or the tackle? It was the... the uh, it was the pass. It was the pass interference. Yeah, yeah. Whereas clearly it was a tackle, yeah. but it wasn't called. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, it's 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 not doesn't it wouldn't shine a good light on the sport. That's for sure. It certainly so. wouldn't. And and they're smart enough to try to avoid that. Yeah. Uh, another note on on Toronto, I would say be patient. You know, if the score is zero zero, if the score is zero zero going into the third period, that's great for Toronto. That's not a bad thing. No. Uh, Toronto is so used to playing in these high scoring games. Uh, I wouldn't want them to become nervous if it was a low-scoring game. You know, why aren't we scoring goals? Like, we, we're, whatever. We're don't, worry, don't worry about it. Like, That's what we do. Just be patient. Yeah. Just be patient, I would say. Yeah. Um, I would say depth scoring could be a difference maker in this series, uh, and Toronto has the advantage, I think, as far as depth scoring. Uh, I mean, you got Hyman with 21 goals, Johnson or Johnson with 20, uh, Kaplan with 20, Marlowe with 16, Kadri with 16. 
um, all those players over over 15 goals. And then you have uh, Morgan Riley, I think he has 20 goals, and that's not including Tavares and, and Marner and Matthews. Like this team is, is can score goals uh, at will. I mean, like it, it, they can, they like I said earlier, they they create something out of nothing all the time, uh, and a lot of these players do that all the time. So um, use that. That's their strongest weapon. That is their biggest punch, and uh, we'll probably see that in this series. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's actually all I have to say for Boston and Toronto. That that wraps up my thing. Uh, my prediction, uh, we've already, I think we've both picked Boston to go on to the second round. Uh, I'm picking Boston in seven. I hope you're right. I hope this goes seven games and is an, a fantastic and exciting series to watch. You said it, six though, right? I said five. Oh, five. I said five. Oh, that's bold. It is bold. And it'll all come down just to the first two games. After the first two games, you'll know what's going to happen. If Boston wins their first two games at home, I think Toronto probably wins game three, but Boston puts their foot down in game four and finishes it off in game five. Wow. If Toronto wins one of the first two games in Boston, and they're talent-wise fully capable of doing that, then it's on. Hmm. And I think the game or the series could go deep after that. Interesting. So I think Toronto needs to win one of those two games in Boston. They can't just hope they're going to win their two home games and tie the series at 2-2. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's enough for Toronto. I think Boston will have the authority and uh, be able to put their foot down uh, after that. So Toronto needs to shock them. I think Toronto might win the first game. I'm hope, and Actually, I'm hoping for Toronto. Are you, are you cheering for I, Toronto? Absolutely cheering for Toronto. Uh, I have friends that are Boston fans. I have friends that are Toronto fans. Probably a majority of my non-Montreal hockey friends are Toronto fans. Mm. So for their sake, I really want Toronto to do very well. I want them to win this series. Uh, I think it's a great story for hockey. Uh, it feeds into the Tavares move. Uh, it, it feeds into the Marlowe story where he's not getting any younger and how many chances will he have mm-hmm. to, to do what he w- needs to do. So for all those reasons, I think it's great for, for Toronto. Boston has had a cup fairly recently. So I'm not as worried about them being depressed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because after 26 years now, I know what depression is when it comes to your team not winning the cup. And I can only imagine what Toronto's going through 52 years later. Yeah. So uh, I agree. Yeah. I, I'm actually cheering for Toronto as well. Uh, I, I said Boston in seven, but honestly, I would not be surprised if Toronto won the series. Uh, I hope they do. Um, I don't necessarily like either of these teams because I, heart, I am a Canadians fan. Um, but I would like Toronto to, I would like to see Toronto win this series and at least get a shot at the second round against uh, Tampa, Tampa or Columbus. Or, or Columbus. And either way, it'd be a great series. And if Toronto can beat Boston... There's no limit on what else they can do. If Toronto can be Boston, Toronto can be Tampa. That's right. I think. That's right. And the the evolution of Toronto as a team, and there's some question marks about are they a team? There are a bunch of players all wearing the same colored jersey, but mm-hmm. are they really a team yet? Even if they're not a team now, and people will argue that they already are, but if they're not a team on game one, if they actually win this series in six or seven games, they will be a team at the other end of that. I agree. And I think they get much better because of that in the second or third round. I agree. If, if Boston wins this series, do you think that they are, will be f- too physically exhausted to take down Tampa or Columbus? Not if it goes only five games, which is what my prediction is. But if it goes seven like last but year. If it goes seven, I think Boston's, Boston's hurting. And you won't know it because they won't tell, but they'll be bandaged up and wearing goodness knows what kind of uh, equipment to try to shield and hide themselves uh, from these... Uh, crying eyes of journalists because I think so too. they'll want to see every shoulder, every separated shoulder, every twisted an- knee or ankle. Um, I think they'll, I think whatever, if this series goes deep, six or seven games, I think whatever team comes out will be hurting. And that's maybe the problem with this playoff format where Boston being one of the best teams in the NHL, top five team in the, in the NHL, has to face another top five team in the second round. And that maybe that's a little bit unfair, but that's a that's a video for another day. It is a video for another day, but it bears paying attention to because a team that does so well, as well as Boston has done, and as well as Toronto has done, they should have earned the luxury of playing a team that didn't do as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, the I fact agree. that they're playing each other is frankly a travesty. I agree. And it's unfortunate good. that only one will advance. It's good that these two teams are playing each other, though, for, as a hockey fan, because this series is going to oh, be amazing be to watch. So, it's going to be great. Uh, I hope you guys are excited for it. I'm very excited for it. Uh, thank you very much for watching this video. hope you can hit the subscribe button down, down below and uh, see our future 
two series preview videos, which will be Calgary versus Colorado and Washington versus Carolina. And if you haven't seen our previous series preview videos uh, before this one, please go watch those and also our bracket prediction video. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Adios. Thank you.